Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by yours truly, Mommy Income. Y'all know me. I'm your host, Kristen Ostrander, and I'm so glad you're here. I have a special guest on today. We are talking to Susie Hickson, and she is the founder and CEO of not one, but two companies and probably more, um, Legally Blissed and Advogents. And she is an IP attorney, an entrepreneur, and a fellow podcaster. And she absolutely loves helping women specifically become self advocates uh, for their self, the self development, and of course, focusing on the law, talking about legal professionals. Why are we having her on today? Because we're going to talk about IP claims. We're going to talk about intellectual property. We're going to talk about Amazon. We're going to talk about why they hit you with IP claims, how you can prevent them, and how you can move forward knowing. Uh, what to do to prevent them and also to better your business, protect yourself, protect your bundle listings and make sure that you're not getting into trouble because sometimes what we don't know gets us into trouble. And so we want to know a little bit more so that we don't accidentally get hit with a lawsuit that we didn't realize we were bringing on ourselves. Y'all, this happened to me. And so I don't want it to happen to you. And I want to prevent that from happening and, and give you the information that you need to move forward. Now, of course, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a second about talking about branding, brand registry, trademarks, why this is important. Yes, we're talking about IP claims today. So many of you have been hit by IP claims. We can talk about what is, what isn't, how you prevent them, things like that. But we also are going to talk about trademarking and why brand registry on Amazon is going to be essential eventually. And so you might as well get it done now. We're going to talk about picking the right type of trademarks, um, ensuring that you can get it uh, approved and move forward. You are dealing with a government entity and attorneys and lawyers and laws and things that you have to follow. So it's really important to be educated on these topics and know exactly how to prevent yourself from getting in trouble and also getting your brand approved. So why is it important? Well, you need a trademark in order to get brand registry. Brand registry opens up amazing doors for you on Amazon. Do you have to have it? No. Should you have it? Absolutely. And there's certain requirements. You're going to need a trademark. Your trademark can infringe upon anybody else's. It has to be unique and different. You have to have, you should be using it already. So we're going to talk about these different things, but you need a trademark in order to get brand registry. And I personally believe brand registry is eventually going to be required by Amazon. And so the sooner that you get ahead of the curve, the better. If you want to succeed on Amazon, having your own trademark and your own brand is going to help you significantly, especially if they decide to change the rules um, abruptly and you don't have time to keep up. That will weed out a ton of people that aren't already brand registered and don't have trademarks. So get in now. It's really worth your investment. Can you do it yourself? Absolutely. And we have training inside the wholesale bundle system to teach you how. I believe in module five, module four and module five teach you exactly how to do it yourself, file your trademarks. So listen to this episode and then go and look at it. Also, I offer trademark filing assistance. I am not an attorney. I am not um, qualified as an attorney, but I have done the brand registry, trademark registry process and filing applications over 10 times. So I know exactly what to look for. I know exactly how to file it. I can walk you through it if you need that. So you can reach out to admin at mommyincome.com and inquire about our trademarking assistance. So you do not have to pay an attorney in order to get this done. But it's helpful to understand exactly what's required of you and what to avoid and the um, tips and tricks. So that's why we have Susie coming on today. I'm ex so excited to have her here. She is a wealth of information. And without further ado, let's welcome Susie to the show. Susie, thank you so much for joining us here on the Amazon Files today. How are you? I'm great, Kristen. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm happy to be here. Yes, I'm so excited to jump into talking about IP claims and intellectual property and trademarking and all the fun stuff that you do. But I would love for you to give your just a little self intro and tell people a little bit about your background and how you arrived where you are today. Well, yeah, thank you for um, the opportunity to talk about IP, especially trademarks is something that I really love. I started out um, I actually graduated from law school 20 years ago this year, which kind of is mind blowing. <laughs> and I started out doing patent work. And that's where you patents protect inventions, right? So your claims drafting. And I did that for two years and didn't really love it. So I transitioned over into trademark work, which is the protection of um, brands. And, you know, I'm like, how cool is this? I get to look at 
pictures and words all day, right? Um, so I was in a big law firm for about seven years. And then I started my own boutique practice in 2010. And I've had my own firm and I I love it usually. <laughs> um, it has, you know, it has its ups and downs. And in addition to um, doing trademark work, primarily prosecution, I also am an online seller. So I know a little bit about this world um, as a seller. I'm on Etsy and not not Amazon, but I think I can, I, I've helped my clients navigate some of the challenges that I know that all of these um, online platforms can can bring. For sure. Well, thank you so much for that background. I love um, that people, you're so multifaceted. A lot of people are, they have <laughs> passions and interests and different things. Well, you know, I love that, that, you know, this new day and age, we can jump ship as many times as we want, you know, so transitioning from here to there and 20 years, we both have 20 years of experience in our field. So uh, yeah. that is so, that is so exciting. So y'all, um, Susie is bringing to the table 20 years of experience plus my 20 years. That's 40 years of experience you're getting today. So you're welcome. And wow. let's get to it because <laughs> there is a lot. First of all, um, there's a lot of Amazon sellers that face these IP claims. Are you familiar with the type of IP claims that come through Amazon to Amazon yeah. sellers? Primarily the claims that I've seen are, are they're, they're counterfeit related claims. And because I um, have clients who are selling on the platform, they've been proactive about protecting their trademarks. And oftentimes we will find third parties who are selling um, products that are counterfeit, that actually re that aren't originating from my client, but may be um, displaying their trademark. Now, another thing, of course, we deal with is would be just infringement, right? Where it might not be intentional, like a counterfeit, but there's a there, we have a situation where we two trademarks are a little bit a little bit too close in appearance, and in those situations, we will um, do demand letters if we can find a seller, which obviously is a little more challenging um, on Amazon. And of course, we will go through the Amazon platform and send demands if if we have to. Can you define the difference between um, infringement and or like actual violations? What are the differences in between the two? Yeah, so an infringement would be more of a legal term, right? And an, a, viol a violation would be something that would be more Amazon specific. So I might be dealing with an infringement from a third party who's not even selling on Amazon, right? A client might see an infringement on a Walmart product. That's just an example. Mm -hmm. Now, with respect to Amazon, it is more specific with like their policy violations. So when you're, but that would actually fall under infringement, if that makes sense. It's sort of a subset of infringement that Amazon deals with specifically would be those po policy violations. And you have to be really careful on, and I understand that we're kind of approaching this from two different sides here, right? Like in infringement, would you would be dealing with that if you were the brand owner and mm -hmm. you came across someone who was using a similar mark, whereas um, you have to be careful as a seller on Amazon, if you aren't proactively protecting any brands yourself, you want want to make sure that you're not actually infringing anyone else's brand. Does so what would sense? be an, yes, yeah. so what would be an example you think of like an infringement so that Amazon sellers would be doing? That's okay. From the perspective of the brand owner or the the infringer. So the infringer. So I, I would guess like some of the violations I've seen come through have been you you basically you you took a image that you don't have permission to use from Google or you're using right. their brand name with uh, as like a competitor rather than saying like, OK, like Velcro is a great example. Velcro is pretty much the only brand name of hook and loop fasteners, which is actually the definition of that. But yeah. the Velcro is the brand. Yet oftentimes because it's one of the only brands out there people refer to it as Velcro and that's actually a brand name that you can't use. Yes. So those are, those are that as an example. Yeah. Okay. So the first, first of all, I am a huge fan of proactively protecting your own trademarks if you can, because owning those trademarks is a huge asset for your business. So really think about what assets you might have that could be eligible for, for trademark protection. 
we can talk more about that in a minute. That's that's more about being proactive um, with the with the protection of your IP. Now, kind of what you're saying is, you know, how do you navigate this whole world of avoiding infringement of other people's? Yes, problems? yes, that, that right. was a better question. I don't know. I didn't no. ask it properly. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine because it it can get confusing, and I just want to make sure that I'm kind of on the. I'm taking, <laughs> the, I'm, I've got to get myself into the right shoes, right? Mm -hmm. So now like, let's say that I am selling cute designs. I'm doing print on demand or what is it? Amazon has merch, um, Amazon merch. Mm -hmm. um, and I come up, I find something really cute. I'm like, oh, I really want to use this saying that says something about Velcro baby or mm -hmm. whatever, right? You, ha you do, you have to be really careful. If you see something that looks super cute and witty, and unless it's, you know, being used on hundreds of thousands of other t-shirts out there, I strongly suggest doing a quick and dirty trademark search. And just to make sure that it's not already registered. And there's, you know, there's no slam dunk in doing these searches. Um, but if you do start using something on the front of a shirt, and I'm, I'm trying to think of an example, there's a really popular shirt right now. It says something about like, my daughter-in-law is my favorite child or mm -hmm. something. I don't know if you've seen that one, but that's really trendy right now. Um, I would suggest doing a quick trademark search for that just to make sure that it's not already registered because you definitely, <laughs> you don't want to get, um, you know, demand, you don't want to get number one, a demand letter from the, the trademark owner. And you definitely don't want to um, do anything on Amazon or, or eBay or Etsy, right. To put your account in jeopardy. And if you have a certain amount of violations and you could definitely uh, jeopardize your, your account. But my suggestion would be if you do come up with something or if you're like, okay, I really see that a particular little saying or, you know, whatever is trending, do a quick and dirty search. The first way that you can do it would be just to get on Google and see what else is being used out there. Sometimes it's pretty obvious. Like there's a domain name and you can click on there and you can, you can see that they're using a little TM next to it. That's a pretty good, like no stop sign slash warning sign that, hmm, okay, someone may be claiming this as their trademark, right? So the, the next thing you can do is go to the USPTO website and that's USPTO.gov. Have it on your check, like, I'm sure if you're selling on Amazon and you have a checklist of things that you do before you put something on, you know, Amazon before you publish it, you know, make sure you do that search on the USPTO website. Again, nothing is a slam dunk in the, the USPTO website's a little clunky. It can be a little hard to search, but search for just slightly different word variations. Um, the other kind of confusing thing here is that you know, let's say you come across a term that is something you want to use, but they're selling a totally different product under it, mm -hmm. right? They're selling boats. I'm giving this as a random example. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a boat seller. You, you know, you still may be in violation or infringing a trademark if you put it on a t-shirt, even though the goods are, are totally different. Um, there it's, there's a lot of gray area. It's very subjective. And that's why you, you know, have trademark lawyers. Of course, you can have a trademark lawyer help you do, do the search. And, and it might give you a little more peace of mind and comfort level before you start using a mark. And um, there's other platforms out there that you can use that I suggest looking at, put it on your checklist. Um, one of them is called Noem and that is spelled K N as in never, O-W-E-M, as in mom. Now, the cool thing about this platform, Noem, is you can search across social media handles as well as domain names in the USPTO while you're doing that kind of, um, yeah, again, I call it a quick and dirty search, right? Are there any obvious conflicts? Anything that says, hey, I cannot use this mark, I shouldn't throw it on a t-shirt, um, that, you know, something that would give you a big red flag. That's a great way to, to, to learn more, to, to, to kind of know what your obstacles might be. If you're seeing that someone's using a, a social media handle that has kind of your little saying that you're wanting to, to use, then I would dig in a little more and see, see what they're doing. 
The other thing that I know that a lot of people are doing that I have to give a little bit of a word of warning about is, um, you know, sports teams, um, certain platform, certain industries are highly aggressive in enforcing their trademarks. And, and a lot of times these sports teams, uh, I guess the NFL is not a team, but uh, kind of. Teams. They're very aggressive. The, the NFL is very, yeah. very aggressive on Amazon for specifically the collegiate teams are following right after. I haven't really tried a whole lot of other ones, but years past I was selling NFL stuff, you know, making lots and lots of money. And then all out of the clear blue sky, they sent out these huge applications and they say, we're cutting off all NFL by X, Y date. You have to apply. And then they wanted you to have some crazy amount of sales for you to be, even be considered. It was a 20 page application with financial documents and all this stuff. I submitted one, of course, and still was denied after so many years and yeah. they removed everything and they're very aggressive about that. So I definitely understand um, that way. But then what about those that seemingly are still using those types of trademarks, but in um, seemingly backdoor black hat type ways um because you still see a lot of nfl things like on other platforms and on amazon and they're not currently in violation. are they doing anything right <laughs> well my thought on that typically is they just haven't found it yet right right i mean and the, the other thing as well and i kind of you know as someone who helps her clients enforce their trademarks also you know sometimes you just have to choose your battles <laughs> Right. right. And it's um, can be really hard when there is a lot of um, when there is a lot of infringement going on out there to kind of figure out, OK, who is it we really need to go after? Right. Is it granted any any use that you're seeing out there? And this kind of comes from staying in the shoes as a trademark owner. But if you're seeing any use of your trademark out there that you're concerned about infringement, you have an obligation to enforce your trademark. Mm -hmm. Um, because your trademark not only helps you grow value in your brand, but it also protects the consuming public from, con from buying confusingly, you know, similar products. So that's kind of the interesting thing about trademark laws. It doesn't just exist to help the brand owner, but it also has a consumer kind of facing, um, benefit to it as well. Absolutely, because you know, if so let's always use Nike as an example because they're one of those that are just very highly protective and also highly yeah. counterfeited. And you know, if you are advertising a Nike product, you want you have a certain level of expectation when it comes to quality and um, presentation right. and everything else. And so, if you're saying it's compatible to Nike, and then someone gets it and realizes this is kind of poor quality, it doesn't have the no Nike logo, like you kind of are wondering, this said Nike, but it's not really. So it's also protecting the entire of the brand. Now I have a specific question regarding Amazon. We do wholesale bundling here and wholesale bundling. I know you might not be familiar with that. Um, think subscription box, except not a subscription. We're putting gift boxes together. That's our wholesale bundle system. We're putting things like gift boxes or accessory kits, things like that, that complement some bigger brand name stuff or include brand name items within our gift baskets. So if you think of a gift box or a gift basket with multiple items inside of it from multiple yeah. brands, yeah. Yeah, Except yeah, my yeah. brand is Kristen's favorite things and I put them in boxes and sell them as cute little gifts. So a lot of people come and say, well, what about the IP for using something as I'm actually trademarked in goods and services for customized um, gift baskets. That is my company's trademark. So Kristen's awesome. favorite things. Um, that's not the name of it. My, my It's a proprietary, but Yes. Um, but my brand name and it, I'm I'm known under that and that's my that's how I'm trademark. It's a service of gift basketing. So when it comes to that, me and my clients are all creating these types of baskets and working with different brands. And some of them we get permission from, and some of them don't require permission to use their products. You yeah. know, we buy them wholesale, and it's we good can. For them. Yes. Um, so the the thing there that a lot of my clients have questions with is, well, how do I? How am I? making sure I'm not violating any of these trademarks when I'm doing a gift basket it might be a spa gift set. And I might use Burt's Bees um, lip gloss, but then I might be using uh, Pantene hair care. And then, so right. it's kind of this combination. And so those are the questions my clients tend to have the most of is like, how do I make sure I'm protecting myself against that when I'm putting a gift basket together? Is that a misuse of a trademark and things like that? I, I wouldn't consider that a misuse of a trademark. Um, there's a couple of, of issues here. Um, of course, the first thing you want to do is 
the, you know, it would be great if you could do it all wholesale, right? I presume that you would want to do it all wholesale. And if it's wholesale, as part of that, hopefully you're getting permission from the brand owner to be able to do that. So many brands want you to do that. Yeah, it's like, use this for a promotional item. Yeah, or, you know, or put this in your gift basket, please. We want you to. Now, the other thing um, that, you know, if anyone's kind of doing these bundles can think about is doing exactly what you did is have your own sort of trademark on the basket or the subscription box. So for example, let's say that you offer a subscription, a, a book subscription business and in the, in the subscription, you have um, books and uh, soaps and candles and they're all different brands. Mm -hmm. So you would want to call that subscription box sort of its own name, right? To make it clear that it's not affiliated with any of those products that you have in there. Like yes. the Burt's, so I don't know if Burt's mm -hmm. beeswax makes soaps, but I'm just going to give an example here, right? So it's make, it's clear that it's, you are providing kind of the service yes. of offering this subscription box. It's not really the product itself. Um, so that would be kind of my guidance on that is making sure that you have secured your own trademark for your own, um, for your own gift basket. Yes. Thank you. And thanks for confirming that because that's what I've been teaching and what I've, I, I had um, <laughs> another attorney that I spoke with years back that said the very same thing. It was just like having your own brand and you're representing yourself on Amazon. I am representing myself on Amazon as a gift box company and right, my right. gift box company is trademarked Kristen's favorite things. And yeah. these favorite things could be food products or this products, but the whole idea is a chocolate lovers gift basket by Kristen's yeah, favorite yeah. things. And it might have Godiva and it might have um, Dove and all these different things. But the whole yeah. idea, my concept, my, my brand is Kristen's favorite things boxes, you know, so that is you right could, on track. You could go like even a little further. And I don't know if it would really even be necessary, but you could say Kristen's favorite things is not affiliated with Godiva. Mm -hmm. Right. Or that you could have like a little disclaimer, you know, a disclaimer or an inset insert in your product that says Godiva is owned by, um, I don't know, Cam who owns Godiva. I want to say I don't like, know. I don't remember. something random, but, um, so yeah, you know, like where you would say these marks are not, uh, are owned by these entities, right. To make it very clear, because again, it's not, it, it goes down so much to protecting the consumer and making sure that they'll, they're well informed about where the products originate from. Yeah. And all of my clients, I always encourage them. They're buying these things wholesale. So they're, op they're, they're opening accounts with wholesalers. They're, they're ordering products wholesale. So they have invoices for every item that's in their box, in their uh, bundle. Um, so they have, I mean, that's not necessarily permission to use the product, but it's permission to sell the product. And some people have brick and mortar stores. Some people are selling on eBay. We're selling on Etsy, Amazon, everywhere. So they get permission by buying wholesale there. So just making sure that we're protecting ourselves in that space from not infringing upon it. So do you suggest like some sort of disclaimer at the bottom of your Amazon listing saying, you know, all, you know, we're, we don't own the trademarks of these companies or whatever, if you're using a brand name? I don't think it would hurt um, to put that in there. I'm sure the brand owners would appreciate the, you know, the delineation of the ownership of the trademarks, mm -hmm. um, because again, it comes down to consumer protection as well. And I'm sure Amazon would, would be, I don't want to say I'm sure because Amazon, Amazon is Amazon, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You say no, say no more. We already yeah. understand. They are, they are them and they yeah. kind of do whatever they want. <laughs> right. I want to say, oh, I'm sure Amazon would think that's great, but like, there could be some reason that Amazon's like, no, you know, you, because it's yeah. Amazon. And you just, when you think that you have something figured on out on Amazon there, <laughs> you know, there's something that changes. So Amazon can be really challenging to navigate. And, you know, from my experience with doing the, you know, some of the, of the enforcement work on Amazon is that it's, it seems inconsistent in the, in the application of its policies. And you have to be you have to be very careful. I mean, I did some some um, enforcement work for a client and they ended up remo removing my client's listings from Amazon mm -hmm. and they got them back up. But it was like, this is just a complete nightmare because it, yeah. it was a weird internal thing that Amazon did. And I was like, can they not read the demand? Let, like it, it was very bizarre. So um, I feel like anytime you, you're kind of messing with Amazon, like, in you know, something crazy could happen. So you know, if you have your listings up, they look great. You're not having any problems. Don't go back and tweak it to do, <laughs> but it, it might, it might be something to think about going forward. Um, you know, do you want to have some kind of language that says that, 
you know, this particular trademark is owned by some other entity. So yeah, that's, I think that's a great addition if someone wants to mess with that too, is basically saying like a disclaimer, just like you would with an affiliate link or something, you know, you have to just make exactly. a disclaimer there that, you know, Kristen's favorite things is, is, a, is a gift box company and we use multiple brands. We do not own the trademarks of the products inside, only, you know, this service that we provide here to put these, curate these boxes in a special way. So maybe that yeah. would be some sort of disclaimer someone can add at the bottom of their description so that it's there, you might be protected. And then if there is some sort of IP claim that comes against you. You can say, hey, I already said this and I have all these invoices that show that I ordered this legitimately. These aren't counterfeit. Now that's another thing, counterfeit. You mentioned that earlier and I wanted to circle back to it. Um, you know, some people get these counterfeit claims except for um, a lot of them are false. Someone will say this is counterfeit because they just, they're, comp, they're competition and they want you to go away. But in fact, you bought it from a legal sales channel. You can buy it from Walmart if you want to and then resell yeah. it on Amazon. And you're actually not violating someone's IP um, or any of, there's no violation to buy something from a store and resell it somewhere else. That's not illegal. <laughs> and so right. uh, sometimes people will reach out and send you an IP claim via Amazon system that's actually false. So what what are your suggestions of going about fighting those when you know that you legitimately bought that it's not a counterfeit product and they're trying to pretend it is? Yeah. So I have typically worked on a counterfeit from the enforcement side because a lot of my clients have counterfeit challenges with uh sellers out of China. And it because it makes it Amazon makes it all too easy for Chinese sellers to be on the platform and to simply like lift, I call it lift, this is probably not the best word for it, but basically copy, right? Um, trademarks and sell on the platform. And the challenge also with that is finding those sellers, right? You can do a demand, you can do sort of like a demand through the platform, um, but actually finding like an email <laughs> or like an actual location is almost impossible in dealing with China and enforcement of a trademark in China can be extraordinarily difficult. Um, as for what to do if you're on the receiving end of that, right? I haven't, I honestly haven't really dealt with that from the receiving end. Um, fortunately, my clients, are, <laughs> they must be crossing their T's and dotting their I's with respect to that. I have seen some egregious stuff, kind of what you were saying, where it's almost like a, like competitive, like competitors who will file false counterfeit claims. Um, of course, you want to submit all your documentation, and that's why it's so important. And I, I think that you kind of went into this a minute ago, is to keep all of your paperwork, right? Keep your receipts, keep your agreements all handy. So if you do have some type of agreement to sell a product, right, you can say, hey, this is not counterfeit. Um, yeah, I had this agreement to, to sell on Amazon or to push it through a third-party platform, whatever it is. So make sure you have all that readily available and push back on, um, on those types of claims. I, I wouldn't just automatically roll over and say, hey, we have a counterfeit claim. I guess we can't do anything. If you can legitimately um, substantiate your um, right to sell a particular item and you've received something from a competitor or I want to say you probably received it not directly from a competitor, but they'll use that Amazon platform to fight you, right? Like they, yeah. they won't actually send you a demand letter. It'll come through the pl platform probably because they're afraid to like show their face because they know it's, it's false. And, you know, it's been a few years since I've actually done any type of enforcement on the Amazon platform, but I'm wondering now if there's a way that you can respond via the platform and sort of contest something like that, right? Because when you have that type of egregious activity going on, um, you, the, your, your only recourse in a lot of ways would, would be Amazon to kind of help you because unfortunately, a lot of these, a lot of this stuff is coming from, um, foreign competitors. Mm -hmm. It can be For so sure. difficult to deal with. For sure. And I know Amazon recently is going through a new verification process to mm -hmm. um, kind of update, improve your identity, which I think will help get rid of some of these naysayers and nay players who are coming in, opening multiple stores from multiple, um, what I call like incognito type or pseudo um, yeah. 
PO boxes and things like that, which I, I have no problem with. I'm an at-home business. So I rent a PO box so that someone can't come to my door because Amazon forces <laughs> you to show your address on yeah. Amazon now as a business entity. So I don't want someone showing up to my front door because they're like, I bought a product from you on Amazon and I wanted to return it. And here's this home <laughs> office, right? So they de but they definitely want some proof that you are who you say you are and that your address and your business entity matches these types of things. So I appreciate their extra verification there because yeah. it helps give more of a face to a name and legitimacy when, within business, a transparency, if you will, which Amazon's not good at um, and not good at enforcing a lot of those things. So um, do you have any prevention tips? We talked a lot about being proactive and kind of prevention. So number one, preventing IPs on your own account, um, not using certain people's marks, right? Of course, that's obvious. Um, what about images? Mm, images. <laughs> Yeah. So this, you know, I want to tell you this, things are getting really interesting with AI and mm -hmm. the ability to generate images that are probably not subject to any type of its own copyright protection. Right. So my suggestion would be to, you know, be very careful, obviously, if you are, first of all, don't copy someone's image, right? I would be really careful about copying clip, clip art off of Canva, for example. And I think a lot of people might do that, but that could be subject to someone's copyright. The challenging thing about copyright versus trademark is it's really difficult to go just search the database to find out if an entity has copyright protection on something. Now, if it's a unique design, um, you, I, I would, pr I would presume that it's subject to copyright protection. Um, in terms of your own, something being kind of your own copyright, if if you create something and you're like, oh, I want, I've created this really cool design and I want to be able to enforce it if someone copies it, then I strongly suggest getting it registered with the copyright office, and that's copyright.gov. I think it's. It's not super expensive to, to get it registered. Um, it doesn't go through quite the examination process that a trademark does. And my understanding is that Amazon's pretty like responsive to copyright claims when you have a registered copyright. So if you wanna do any type of enforcement of your own copyright, get it registered. Um, now kind of back to the, your, you know, stepping into the other shoes as, you know, taking some someone else's images. You know, it, I heard, I used to hear this thing. People would say, well, if I take some clip art and I change it seven times, is that good enough? Well, there really, <laughs> there really is no, there's no, no black and white here, right? It's all, there's so much gray area with respect to copyright law and, and even trademark law for that matter. But, um, you know, my suggestion would be just don't, don't take anything, don't like, I know that it's so easy to take a screenshot of something, right? So it's t-shirt design and slapping on yours. Just don't do that because you, <laughs> you very well could get a takedown uh, demand from Amazon or from the brand, the brand owner slash copyright owner. Um, if you are, I would suggest creating your own stuff. Like I know that a lot of people are doing really cool, you know, fonts and things like that. It's super easy to create your own designs in Canva and it'd be fairly unique and cute. Um, if you are using one of those platforms that say, that will actually like send you the design file, just, I would say, make sure that you do own the rights. Well, I'm sorry, you wouldn't actually own the rights to it, but make sure that it would be available for you to use for commercial purposes. And of course, that would have to be kind of in the terms of service with that particular platform that sells those digital images. That being said, I want to go back to the, the AI generated images just a little bit. Um, we're getting to where we're seeing a, the ability to do text on, on um, AI generated images. So it's going to be really interesting to see where that goes because it's going to be kind of easier, quote unquote, for people to hop on to Mid Journey or Night Cafe or Leonardo, any of these AI generation platforms and create t-shirts via text Im image prompting with text in the image. Mm -hmm. And my suggestion in those situations, if you are playing around with those, make sure that you read and fully understand what you are getting. Number one, when you're, if you're paying a monthly fee and what you're permitted to do with, with those generated images. Um, 
for example, Leonardo is sort of a slightly newer one. It's a lot of fun, kind of cool. Um, I just got access to it. I highly recommend getting on there and playing around if you love design. <laughs> and um, they might have a wait list right now, but get, just get on it. <laughs> um, I was playing around with it the other day and I was look, I was reading its terms and it was like, you own the output, like do whatever you want with the output. Now, of course, there is going to be debate about, well, what about, what about the input, right? With respect to these images, where are all of these images coming from. But um, I take the position that AI generated art is it, just, it's just another, um, it's just another kind of in, iteration of technology and art, just like photography. You know, I'm sure painters kind of freaked out when the camera was developed, right? People were like, oh my gosh, we have, you know, <laughs> I can't paint anymore because now we have cameras. Um, but I just think it's just another um, iteration of it. And I encourage people to look at it, but in you know, for creating unique designs. Um, but if you are using a particular platform, do make sure that you understand um, what type of out, like how you own the, the output and what capacity you own the output and do you own it for commercial purposes? Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting to know, because I know like with Canva Pro, for example, you pay a monthly subscription, which then entitles you to many of the licenses that they have that then they share with you. And some of them do say you cannot use this for commercial purposes, which basically means if you're selling anything, you can't let you can't use it. You can't use it to promote your business. You can't use it, you know, that sort of imagery. But then there's also images that are free to use. They don't have any sort of royalties or barriers or royalty free, um, whatever. So you can use those freely. And so the AI makes yeah. it very interesting because you could upload somebody's image and then say, make these changes on blah, 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 turn this white, <laughs> turn this yellow, turn this, this. Yeah. And then you have a whole new image, but it's based on someone else's. So, you know, that's just shortcutting and using it that way but how you know, like how much do you have to change it until it's yours <laughs> well this is why there's been so many copyright cases litigated not only in art or you know images but also in music you know how different does that new piece have to be for it not to be infringement and it's so great like i was saying ago, there's no black and white it's it's so great it can be it can be so subjective and i, I just saw in you know, I'm kind of to the point, Kristen, where I presume an image is fake until I know that it's like, until it's been authenticated, right. you know, um, we're really the, I think we're kind of getting to that point. And I recently came across some additional AI technology where they're taking photographs um, and just slightly like just somehow using the AI. And I don't, I'm not, I don't understand how they're doing this, but like, for example, a dog, a photograph of a dog looking at the camera and they're able to sort of like reposition the dog's head so that it was like sideways, like wasn't looking at the camera and they made it tell longer and like all of these little adjustments that made the image completely different. It was an actual photograph, but they were using AI to make these little adjustments in that photograph. So it's like, where are we going to draw the line from human input to AI generated content and or images content whatever and right now you know there has to be a certain element of human input before anything will be protected by copyright so if you if you are just letting leonardo for example produce all of your images and there's no kind of you know element of human input there you may not be eligible to actually getting those registered with the copyright office as the law currently stands. Yeah. So, that's... And it's evolving so quickly. Like the tech is evolving a lot faster than the law. I'm sure people are so <laughs> surprised to hear that lawyers are slow to change. <laughs> the, law, the law and lawyers are so, so slow to change, right? And, and they're so behind technology. Well, and technology is moving so fast that by the time you actually catch up, there's something new and then there's something new that you have to fight. And then it's all subjective, yes. uh, just like trademarks. You know, I've been rejected yeah. for some of my trademarks because of subjectivity, uh, yeah. because they're like, well, we really can't trademark that phrase or that name or that brand because this and this and this. Um, so I've seen I've seen that as well. And with the AI, the, the reality here is um, for anyone that's listening, do your own thing 
even if you're using AI, do your own thing. There's so much help out there. You don't have to be a designer anymore. You can go and be like um, telling, you know, Leonardo, for example, or like Midjourney is another one I've, I've, I've used and just telling it, I want create an image that has this and this and this. I want a teal chair with a this person sitting in it with this and this on the wall and whatever. And all of a sudden this pops up and then you've kind of created that and you can, you know, manipulate it the way you want to. But the reality is creating your own stuff, trademarking your own own brand, your own services, um, so that you have your own protection. And then the next is preventing those IP claims coming to you. Don't use people's pictures without permission. I don't care if they're readily available on Google. Your yeah. screenshot of that is still a violation. <laughs> your use of their yeah. brand name without you know trying to spam the keywords is still a violation. Yeah. So yeah. what do we do? We avoid that. We do something different. We do something that's above board because your business isn't worth <laughs> risking it's or having your... It your listing yeah. taken down or your business taken down because you're stepping on someone else's toes. Yeah. And I tell people, um, you know, my clients specifically, I, I am a big fan of being really proactive in protecting your intellectual property and really developing a, a, a company and a brand that um, has longevity, right? Something that's not fly by night, something that is a valuable asset that you could, could sell, right? Or, give to your children or <laughs> favorite nephew. I don't know. Right. Um, so just being proactive and taking care of your own IP and developing your own IP is the best way in a lot of ways to kind of avoid, avoid infringement because you're focusing on growing an asset and your own stuff rather than going out and copying all of this other stuff, which you're, when you're doing that, you're, and you're thinking, okay, well, what if I kind of I, I think I can start this if I just change this one word in this logo. Like instead of Nike, what if it's like N I Susie? Will N I K E E work? Like no, N I K E E is not going to work, right? Like <laughs> right. Like instead of instead of trying to like figure out ways to skirt, figure out ways to grow your own asset. Um, I love that. You know what? It's so funny because we've talked about, I've talked about this with my audience before and I've said that to them. I'm like, is some of these bad players or what I call lazy entrepreneurs that are just yeah. interested in copying and pasting because they're just trying to make a quick buck. If they would slow down just a little bit and focus on building their own asset, like you just said, I've been preaching this for several years uh, about trademarking and getting brand registry on Amazon and creating your own brand. And a lot of people will come and they'll be like, I don't really want my own brand. I'm just trying to resell on Amazon. I'm not trying to be, I don't want my brand in Target or this, that. I'm like, you don't have to have your brand be a household name for it to be protected. I said, you're not creating a brand. You're protecting your business by giving it assets. Assets are sellable. You are, you, I, I always ask people, I say, yeah. are you going to, are you going to do this for the rest of your life? Like until you die. And most people are like, no, I eventually want to retire. I'm like, okay, so retirement requires either passing the torch in your business, selling it or closing it. What do you plan on doing? Well, I didn't know I could sell my business. Okay, well, to sell your business, what kind of assets do you have? Do you have a trademark? Right. Do you have a patent? Do you have a, a what kind of asset is your business? Yeah. And so at that point, they're like, oh, well, if you have a brand name, now you have an asset, you're established. And you yeah. can, even if it's for $50,000 or even $20,000, even if you did this for five years and we're like, okay, I'm retired. I, I don't I want to move on to something else. You can sell your brand, even though it's not known by Target or it's not yeah. in Best Buy or Walmart, whatever, who cares? Like you still built a brand with custom packaging and a trademark. It has value to someone, right? So it's right. building, it's not just, just, a trademark. It's building an asset that which you can redistribute at some point and or pivot or change or sell. And it has value the moment that you invest in that. So I always talk about looking at it as a business investment, just like you need to set up your LLC or you need to file your taxes or you need to get a DBA. You need a trademark of some sort so that you also have it's legitimacy. It's it's um, an asset you can yeah. sell. You can even sell your dot com for, you know, that's an asset as well. It's called Internet real estate, like internet that. real estate, <laughs> AKA a dot com, a dot net, a dot something, a domain is really internet real estate. So if you I have that. that and you have a trademark, anyone, maybe blue bananas. Okay. So this is, I'm just making this up, but if your company's yeah. called blue bananas and you sell wholesale bundles on Amazon for 
three years and then you realize, oh, I want to move on to something else. I'm going to go play tennis the rest of my life. I don't care what it is. So you now have blue bananas. And if someone over here actually made something with blue bananas, they want your real estate. You could sell them the trademark and the name and the dot com and they can do what they want with it. And whether they're selling on Amazon or not, you still have this asset. So I'm always encouraging people, whether it's ABC Mercantile, I don't care what it's called. Um, you have an asset to build and you also have protection under Amazon and the law if you choose to release something in that name that then someone else decides is great and they want to copy you. So protection is everything. Of course, every attorney is all about protecting <laughs> our assets right um so i really appreciate yeah. all of your insight and all of all that you've been sharing with the ips and uh, trademarking and all that kind of stuff can you get everybody a chance to get to know you a little better what's the best way for them to reach out and find you on the internet yeah so if you want to learn a little bit more about me you can connect with me on linkedin it's just my name Susie hickson s-u-z-i-h-i-x-o-n or you can find me um when i'm wearing my trademark hat at suzyhickson.com Awesome. Thank well, you thank back. you. Thank you again for so much. And of course, all these links will be in uh, the chat for everyone to be able to reach out to you. Of course, I know, does your firm help people with filing trademarks if they need that and verifying and all the yeah, research? We, we sure do. And, and I was going to say, I, I actually way prefer working with people um, who are being proactive about protecting their IP and that are wanting to build sort of a long-term brand, something that they can actually sell um, at the end of the day, right? Because I think that there's there's just so much value in that. And yeah, that's something we do. I do um, trademark clearance. I make sure that clients have um, marks that are quote unquote free to use, right? We were talking about a minute ago how there is subjectivity involved. So there is no slam dunk. Um, the other thing I love helping clients with is um, creating trademarks. And I say always say, the best trademarks are created rather than just selected. And, you know, I think that it's really good to find trademarks that are awesome at sort of the intersection of marketing and legal. One thing I've learned is like a lot of marks that seem really great from the legal perspective aren't so great from the marketing perspective and marks that seem so great from the marketing perspective aren't going to work from the legal perspective. So helping them kind of find that sweet spot um, with their marks is something I love to do also. I love that that's your specialty. You, you, My ears perk up right away when you're talking about creating <laughs> because I, that's so true. There's so many things that are like, oh my gosh, this would be a great name. And then you're yeah. like, Bloon is deflated when you realize <laughs> it's either subjective or it's rejected because you right, thought right. no one owns this. Well, that sometimes there's a reason. Um, I mean, I because, love Blue Banana. I think that's great, but yeah. you know, we'd have to check that out. And <laughs> right. right, but I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I learned going through the trademarking <laughs> process. I have assisted and helped clients not only create brands and then get them trademarks, you know, helping them kind of a DIY situation too. But I love yeah. that idea of having an attorney help you really, not only is this creative and market worthy, but also legal. Like we want to make sure we're not infringing on somebody else. And, yeah. you know, the marketing is everything. You know, we want to have a name that that people are going to remember or a name that's attached to a product that's like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a great well, idea. Let me give you an example of a, like, when you get on Amazon these days, sometimes you'll see these brand names or seller names that are like, blah, 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 you know? Yeah. Like, X, Y, Z, like 4, 8. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let me tell you something. If I went over to, to the USPTO and I tried to register that, it probably could get registered. Like from the legal perspective, as long as it's acting as a source indicator, because guess what? No one else is using it. Because it's it's a terrible trademark from a from a marketing perspective, right? right? It's not like you're going to tell you're going to tell your friends, look at this great shirt I got from blah, 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 on Amazon, right? right? Like you mm -hmm. you say I got I bought these oh like I bought these really fun dog treats that my dog loves. It's called it's called they're called pepperoni, mm -hmm. but they're they're pepperoni, right? So that's a I'm just giving that as an example, pepperoni mm -hmm. as a beautiful trademark that is great from a, from a marketing perspective because it's cute and fun and you get to combine the word puppy and pepperoni. And mm -hmm. it's great from the trade, the actual legal perspective, because it's registrable. No one else has done that. It's, it's unique and distinctive. Mm -hmm. So those types of marks that are like portmanteaus are really, really good. And, you know, it's, it's, 
it takes some creativity to find that sweet spot. It takes some work. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just aren't willing to do it, right? They just, they just want to throw up some things so they can get their brand registered on Amazon. And it doesn't make any sense. Like it's, yeah, it's great for brain registry you can get it registered with the uspto but from for a long-term mark that's mm-hmm. at a real value it's not a good it's it's not a good uh it's not a good idea so don't don't pick <laughs> whatever yeah, and not only that a lot of my clients are building brands that are covering multiple product lines so mm-hmm. I, I i try to inform them to be creative but not so creative that it's so you know blah 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 like using an acronym or using something that's never been used and it, you can use your kids you know acronym names or something putting mercantile or putting some sort of something because we have people that sell auto parts and baby products under the same brand and so we can't have Kristen's baby store if we have you know we're selling yeah. tires too it's so um, yeah. wanting to yeah. pick something that is general but also oddball like I tell people like blue bananas probably would be um an appropriate trademark number one it's just kind of fun to say I'm like have you ever seen a blue banana probably not um but it also could be anything so if when you say blue bananas or blue buffalo we all recognize that probably if you have pets blue yeah. buffalo is a dog food brand right but if you just said that in the clear blue sky without ever hurt hearing of it you'd be like hmm what is that so it's kind of intriguing when you're like oh blue bananas would be a similar thing and you're like have no idea what that is well it's all of our products so um thank you again for all of that insight that was super helpful you guys uh, all of the information here will be below this video and below in the show notes so you can reach out to Susie and her team and get your creative juices going and get your trademark I've been on this soapbox for years now so if this is the 14th time that you've heard this and you still don't have a trademark this is definitely for you. I'm talking directly to you. Get your trademark. It doesn't matter what. Don't stress over it. You don't have to. You don't even have to have a logo necessarily. You can just have the word mark and protect yourself and get moving. You could eventually decide to do a logo or a word mark. But honestly, I'm creative. I like to change things often enough to where it's like I don't want to lock myself into a specific design. But the words. Of course, you guys know I own mommy income, right? So yeah, we want to make sure we're keeping all that and something that maybe can evolve and change as you do because we're we're gone is the era where you go and do a job for 35 or 40 years and then you retire from the same company and get a pension and move on. We are in the internet age with technology moving faster than we can. And there are there's a great chance that in five years from now, you're going to be in a different industry and a different business. Your brand can come with you if you do it right early on. If you're blue bananas and you sell car parts right now, you can be blue bananas and decide to become a lawyer later if you wanted to and still use that if you want so thinking bigger and thinking futuristic and and thinking generally will really help to build you're not building a household name who cares build, build you're building a business asset and so that's what we're telling you to invest in with your trademarks your intellectual property even if you're creating wholesale bundles is still important because if you don't protect it someone else is lazy enough to copy you so thank you, Susie, so much for coming here. I know you could be anywhere else doing any other thing. I don't take that for granted. Thank you for your time, your expertise, and your energy. And y'all, we'll see you same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files.